Yeah, I think we all just spend more all the time. <laughs> but more I meant, um, we choose to be happy, right? You can choose, you can make $20,000 a year and be happy. Yeah. You can make $200,000 a year and be unhappy, right? So choose to be happy and then you know, the rest of it is much more likely to fall into place. Welcome, everybody, back to another exciting show, the About That Water podcast, where we help you build strong financial habits. Today, we are joined by the financial guru, a professor of accounting at Bucknell University, go Bisons, and a true advocate for financial empowerment. She wears the hat of a financial coach and is on a mission to make genuine financial education accessible to everyone. Under the banner of the money teacher, she breaks down both basic and complex personal finance concepts, ensuring that we all have the tools to carve a path towards a bright financial future. So get ready to dive into the realm of dollars and cents with the one and only Professor Stacy Mastrolia, the money teacher. How are you doing today, Stacy? <laughs> I'm great, Anthony. I'm not sure I can live up to all that. <laughs> I'll try, but that was that was very flattering. Thank you. It's great to be here. I mean, you did all the work. You got to give your accolades. <laughs> so one of the things that a lot of us are struggling with right now could be the understanding of getting ready for the holidays when it comes to spending money. A lot of us feel as though, you know, either a we have to get everybody a gift or we just really want to give, you know, our immediate family because times are tough right now. How can we dive into that, that realm of boundaries as we also want to be a gift giver at the same time? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and a real dilemma because I think most people are generous by nature. And, you know, it goes from, it goes from one extreme to the other, just being really generous or actually trying to use money to heal a deeper hurt, right? We come around to the holidays and sometimes we're, we're in a relationship with, with some people that, um, that's broken and trying to heal a broken relationship with money and gifts almost never works because that's not where the break is, right? The, the broken part is something else. Um, so I think the first thing is for everybody, for a person to figure out where they are. Um, so have you been saving all year long? Do you have a sinking fund for Christmas and now you're just ready to spend it? So the question is, how do I spend it within this budget that I set for myself? Um, I put aside fifty dollars a month. Now I have six hundred dollars. How do I um, how do I do do the holidays the way I want to on that six hundred dollars? Um, and the other side is I haven't saved anything yet. Oh my gosh, here we are in November, and you know how will I ever pull all this together? And I think the answer is the same for both. And that's you need to make a list. You need to sit down like quietly with your spouse if you're married um, or in a relationship. And actually figure out what it is that you have available to spend for the holidays. And how do you want to spend it? Because what you're trying to accomplish maybe is bonding with people and spending time with people. In which case, activities, meals, um, you know, time spent together is much more valuable than what you could buy with, you know, 40 or $50 for a person. Um, some people are really hurting. And, you know, a gift card is what they need. Um, you know, a gift card for somebody who's struggling to pay for groceries um, is much more valuable than $50 meal out, which you eat one time and it's gone, right? True, yeah. So really looking at the people that you're trying to love on in the holidays and figuring out um, what are their needs and what resources do you have available? Um, you know, you get somebody maybe older, maybe grandma going in raking leaves could be the best gift you ever gave grandma because she can't rake those leaves, right? Or cleaning a gutter or taking a car to the shop. Um, I don't, I don't think it's always about money. And I think that's one of the things that got lost in the sauce of gift giving. Like you can gift, like how you mentioned the gift of time, mm -hmm. the gift of acts of service. Um, it's almost like the love languages. 
Yeah. You know, figure out what somebody's love language is, is, uh, I think it could be the key for the holidays. And I think we, we lose that as we go along. I think because we don't think about it, right? We get really busy and then it's Thanksgiving. Yeah. And now it's like, oh my gosh, I just saw the whole family for Thanksgiving. And now I have to do, I have to get this, I have to get this. Or we see something, we're like, oh, Susie would love that. You know, Jamon would love that. But that's in the moment. That's not a plan to sit down and say, these are the people that I'm going to love on this holiday. And this is the kind of love that they need. And then set about trying to figure out how to do it. Like, turn it around, right? Put the planning ahead instead of behind. And I believe you are a strong advocate of thinking first before you do. Because even when it comes to budgeting, like, it's nice to, to think about it. But the act of actually doing it, or we call it as a spending plan, we all know that budgeting <laughs> is the, the curse word nowadays. Um, so what are your thoughts on getting people to think about it first? Or what should they really think about? So for the, for the budget or for the holidays? Um, we can budget and holidays. Okay. Because, I mean, they got a budget for the holidays. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's the same process, right? We, yeah. as human beings, we make thousands of impulse decisions every day, right? We impulse what we're going to eat. We impulse where we're going to go. We impulse who we're going to call. Um, that's just, that's just the way we operate. So it's not in everybody's uh, wheelhouse to sit down and make a plan. It's not even in everybody's wheelhouse just to stop for a minute and think, right? Because we get so busy with all the things. So for your budget um, or spending plan, it, it kind of requires once a month, you're going to sit down and you're going to say, okay, November's here. What does November look like in my life? Well, in my life, my as a college professor, November's a pretty busy month because we have a week off for Thanksgiving. So we've got like a lot of deliverables for our students beforehand. But even worse, when we get back, we have like 10 days of classes and the semester's done. We're in finals. So carefully planning for what's going to happen before, what, we, what will I be doing during the, the holiday week, and then what happens after includes time and money. So we tend not to spend a lot uh, those first three weeks of November because I'm busy uh, with work. I don't really have time to, to think about spending. But Thanksgiving week, my daughter and I travel. So we end up spending quite a bit of money because we're eating out and we're enjoying experiences together. Um, and, you know, that makes November look different than October did. So I need a budget for November that says my household does this in November. So I need to have money for gas to drive where we're going. I need to have money for um, the hotel. I need to have money for the restaurants and for the outings. Um and then I won't need as much food because I won't be in the house that week cooking. I won't need, um, you know, things that I do at home. So I think each month to sit down and think about that and then say, what does that mean in terms of numbers? And people get all hung up too. Well, I don't know. Is it going to be $50? It could be $80. It doesn't really matter. Pick a number and put it on the paper and then you can move forward, right? But we end up in this paralysis of the analysis where we can't move forward because I can't get something just right or I don't know something. Estimate it. Estimate it. Put it in and keep on going. Um, so I think that's really important in terms of your monthly plan. And then for any special holiday, birthdays, anniversaries, holiday, um, Christmas and, and Hanukkah holidays, um, again, is, is kind of stopping for a minute and thinking, what do I want that to look like? And then go make that happen. Because yeah. what's one of the things that I've noticed, um, these dates don't change. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so you can sit down and just take the whole brand new calendar. Um, I know at the time of this recording is in November, the 2024 calendars are coming out. You can start planning your next year yeah. and just be like, hey, I know these dates are coming up. This is how much I want to put down and just plan for it. Yeah. I mean, people who want to take a summer vacation, kind of normal, right? Kids get out of school. Yeah. Well, right now it's November. So you got December, January, February, March, April, May, June, you know, like seven months. Yeah. Where are you going to go? How much do you think it's going to cost? Divide it by seven and start that sinking fund so that every month you're putting a little bit away. And then when July comes, you don't have to go like, oh, where am I ever going to get money for that holiday? Oh, I'll just put it on the credit card, right? 
No, you've got a plan. Will it be exactly right? No, but it'll be close enough. And it'll be more than you would have had if you didn't bother to divide it by seven in the first place. Yeah. And it's really the small things. Like you said, small math. You know, I think it's what uh, division came around in third grade, roughly. (laughs) And now we have these crazy things that have apps on them. And you can just put numbers in and it just does it for you. The abacus is not necessary anymore. Like, it's crazy. We don't do this simple kind of. If only we had a device that would do it for us. (laughs) Would that we could create such a thing. Uh, That's too funny. Um, So one of the things that uh, I like to talk about is the strategy side of the house. Because the strategies, it takes a moment of like, what got you to where you are today? And was there something in your childhood that thought about the holidays a little differently the way how you, now you treat your child during the holidays? Yeah, actually. Um, so I come from a big Italian family and I love my big Italian family. Uh, but right now it's just me and my daughter living in this part of the country. Um, we're, we're several hours from, from the, the nearest family. Um, so the idea when we were all in one place, we would all get together like pretty much by noon on Christmas Day, we'd have like the whole family in one house. Um, but we lived 20 minutes away. So now I live three or four hours away. And um, when my daughter was young, I decided that Christmas morning was going to be just us and not the crazy hecticness of driving in New Jersey traffic to, you know, get where I have to be. Um, I just wanted it to be peaceful and calm. So I do see family usually during the week between Christmas and New Year's. Um, and we make a trip over, but the actual holiday itself, uh, we do much smaller because we don't have, you know, family immediately around us. And I choose not to get all wrapped up in traffic and craziness. I also don't shop. Um, like we're done, we're done in the stores by 15th ish oh, okay. because it gets too crazy. You know, I get angry. Somebody steals your parking spot, lines, traffic, you know. Yeah. Maybe I'm just getting grumpy, but uh, I'd just as soon have, you know, everything done. We don't wrap until Christmas Eve. So that's kind of a Christmas Eve tradition. That's nice. Uh, As I would just say for me personally, I am a horrible rapper. So I just buy enough bags that are big enough to hold the (laughs) gift (laughs) and enough tissue. Did the gift bag. That person, like, so smart. They they should get um, what do they call them things, some type of major award, like a global award, <laughs> for that because it works. Yeah, saving all the bad rappers in the world, mm-hmm. and, one bag and, at a time. Yeah, the taping is bad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not going to show any of my gift wrapping. It's it's not worthy. <laughs> <laughs> uh. The reason why I asked about that is because, like, I know, like, my mom, when she tries to do um, the holidays when we were younger, we used to make products because we didn't have much. So she taught us how to sew. So we used to make small pillows and give those away and, like, learn how to do all this extra stuff. Um, Because she went and learned home ec when she was in high school. And so during that time, it was kind of like a family moment. So, so now that we are a lot older, she still forces to get gifts and little extra gifts. And I'm like, Ma, I just want a book. That's all I want. <laughs> I don't need those. I don't need all the extra stuff. I can buy those. Just, just get a book. And that's it. Is there like one gift that you say like you kind of get every year or you appreciate every year? So first, I love your mom. Because rather than teaching you guys to go buy shiny stuff that I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that she couldn't afford. Yes. She taught you to give something from your heart and your time, right? That everybody would appreciate your efforts. Gift. I love books. I have stacks and stacks and stacks of books. Um, I especially like when other people pick out the book for me Ooh. because what they see are my interests or my strengths or my weaknesses, right? Is always interesting. So, I love to get books and I always want somebody to tell me why they picked that book for me. I never thought about that. So I actually have them. Do you have them right inside the book or a separate card? Depends on what they want to do. Um, I do. I do regift. I do um, 
donate books. If I kept every book I ever read, um, I couldn't live in a house. I'd have to, I'd have to live in a, an airplane hangar. Right. So, so I do, but which means that their, their thoughts may travel on with the book. <laughs> but every, everybody who knows me knows that about me. I couldn't possibly keep all the books that I read. I do Kindle. Um, but there's just something about holding a book mm -hmm. that is different. Do you, uh, do you own a book or write a book? I'm in the pro I, I have written one book already. I'm a co-author on one book, um, Accosting the Golden Spire. And I'm actually in the process of writing my second book, which will be a financial literacy book hey. that I can use in my classroom. And it's going to be written or directed specifically towards 18 to 22 year olds who are starting out their life and don't even know what open enrollment for benefits means and has no idea what a 401k is versus a 403b or why they would even care. Right, a 457 um, on top of that. <laughs> yeah, so it'll be kind of written at that uh, for, for intelligent, but ignorant, not knowing people, right? So smart, but nobody ever talked to this before. I've mentioned you here. I mean, I heard you say that before. Can you explain a little bit what you mean by smart, but ignorant? Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of people who are very, very smart, um, especially like I'm, my students. They are very, very smart in their disciplines, but nobody ever taught them about some things. Like nobody ever taught me about playing team sport. It just wasn't when I was a kid. We didn't do that. I didn't do that. Um, so I'm ignorant in that area. That doesn't make me stupid. It just makes just something in the world that I don't know anything about. Um, and I think that's it's that way for a lot of people with money and using it wisely, making good decisions. And there's always such fear that you're going to do something wrong. And, and then when you do that wrong thing, everything's going to be lost. And that really just doesn't usually happen. Right. I mean, none of us should be sending money to the prince of whatever to get the lottery tickets released from our grandkids in prison. Like none of us should be doing any of that. But, you know, within your normal life, um, I, I, it breaks my heart when people who don't invest in their retirement funds in, in their 401k and their employer would have given them a match. So they gave away free money. But the reason when you ask is because, well, they didn't know what to invest it in. Like anything. Anything that's in your 401k plan from your company is not going to be a Nigerian prince, like anything. Um, but that's their hesitation. They don't know how how to take the next step, so they don't take any steps. And, you know, 20 years later, they've got nothing saved. And, you know, now, you know, it is what it is. We start where we are and we move forward in a different direction. But it really does break my heart when I'm working with clients that, you know, they just couldn't make that second decision, so they never made the first one. I love that. Ignorant, smart, but ignorant, unknowing. And because of that, I know we're talking about the holidays and, and the spending plans and stuff like that. And a lot of college students are pretty much in that realm where they cannot really afford to do all the cool things that they would like to do. And especially if they make a new friends and they see what other people are getting them and they just feel bad. Um, because you did touch on a part of, of feelings when it comes to gift giving. How can, uh, or have there been any inkling since you've been doing this financial, uh, on your financial journey to actually teach others uh, how to help people control their feelings? I think it's, you know, it's a level of maturity that everybody comes to eventually, but it's how we control our feelings about all kinds of things, right? I mean, you may be attracted to somebody. You don't run up and bear hug them. That's creepy, right? You may be mad at somebody. You don't throw rotten fruit at them. We don't do that, right? So it's it's learning to control ourselves in many ways. But when my, my students arrive here, they've already mastered those other things. Like I hardly ever see them running up and spontaneously hugging people. Um, but again, nobody ever taught them how to deal with money. So I try and create a revolution that is be honest. Realize that any place you are, college, workplace, within your family, any place you are, some people have more and some people have less. Intelligence, wit, money, physical strength, right? We all have different. So when it comes to money or anything else, you can say, you know, that's great, guys. You guys are going out, whatever. Um, you know, I'm going to, well, I can't go. Or more likely, I'm going to go, 
but I'm just going to have a drink or I'm just going to have an appetizer or I'm just going to have, you know, I'm going to do the activity, but I'm going to do it for less. And if those people mock you for your honesty, I mean, they're not your friends. We would have told, you would have been told that in the third grade, right? If, if somebody's teasing you, then they're not really your friend, right? So it's the same thing. And when, when you are honest, then other people can respond too. Cause you might see that they'll say, Oh, well, that's okay. I mean, we don't have to go out. We could just stay in or, Oh, that's okay. We don't have to, you know, we, we could just do this because if they're really your friends, that's going to be their response. And all my friends know all I order is one alcoholic beverage and french fries. That's all I order <laughs> when I go out. Eat first. Eat first. Then you're not even hungry. So you're not even really tempted, right? But you still get the conversation. You still get the uh, the interaction. Um, and, you know, the people who have more, maybe they share more. Maybe they don't. But it doesn't stop you from participating to the level that you can participate. Yeah. So that brings us to the third segment, which is the featured side of the house. Like what skills or habits do you feel will take you to the next level? I am in a stage right now as my daughter is 14 and pretty regularly assures me that she has no use for me beyond keeping the fridge stocked, the heat on, it gets cold around here, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, letting her friends come over. So I'm actually in a transition and I have been focusing more on uh, the financial literacy side, focusing more on clients, focusing more on um, social media and just trying to provide real financial information to anybody. Uh, you don't have to come and pay tuition to come to my university to, to have, you know, real legitimate financial information provided. So for me to make those transitions, I'm learning. I'm learning about social media. I'm learning about, um, I, I'm pretty good probably at communicating with the next generation because I get that out of my, my teaching skills, um, but in a more informal way. And my classroom is very formal, right? But social media is not. So learning to interact with young people in a more informal way. Um, and I'm trying to learn some, you know, modern slang. So uh, that's that's where I'm spending my growing right now is um, is kind of pivoting a little bit and uh, and learning more how to be more of an extrovert with my my knowledge, my my experience. So what was the latest uh, slang term that you've uh, come across? Yeah. So, oh, gee. Okay. I thought it meant old guy. Okay. And somebody called me an OG. I actually had to, I, I just kind of looked and I was like, hmm. And I just kind of left it at that. And I went and I asked one of my students, I'm like, okay, what does this even mean? Right. Mm -hmm. But then it was really flattered because it means like, like old guard, like somebody who knows a lot about something, has earned respect. Doesn't mean old guy. So yeah, that was my, that's my newest one. Huh. Um, cause I mean, I grew up in Baltimore and OG stood for like original gangster. <laughs> so it been so like from like, you've already been through it and now you're actually giving out the information to the, the young group. Well, now that makes even more sense. Doesn't it? Why somebody <laughs> would call me that and not be an old guy. Right. <laughs> original okay. gangster. Okay. Yeah. See, I'm still learning. Hey, I mean, that's the beauty of it. It's like, no matter what age you are, this stuff works yep. at all aspects of, of life and finance. And that, that's one of the reasons why I love doing, doing this, like interviewing everybody, because we all learn a little bit differently, but we also come into almost the same conclusion of, are we feeling happy about our finances and the way how we're spending our time and money with the people that we love? Mm -hmm. So is there anything that you would like to share with the audience before we go to the final four questions? Um, I don't know. That's very open. What would I like to share with them? Be happy, be generous, right? Make a plan. If the plan doesn't work, change the plan. Learn something every day. Be happy. I love it. <laughs> 
and and yeah, all right, let's go to the final four because we can keep going <laughs> because being happy is it's a feeling, and you know, money also we spend more when we're happy, and I think once we understand, like, if we could take a step back and try to to reel in, like, hey, logically, this doesn't make sense versus. Hey, this is all happy. Let's go down and spend some money. Let's have a great time. Hmm. Uh, but it's interesting that. you say that because I think the statistics actually show that we spend more money when we're depressed because there's um, there's adrenaline that's associated with spending money. There's a happiness uh, hormone that's released that will lift you up um, when you're when you're spending. Uh, unfortunately, then it also lets you back down. But probably more the point is. We spend more kind of on either extreme <laughs> than when we're in the middle. Maybe that's maybe that's the uh, the more thorough answer. Yeah, because I've been following some habits of like how grocery stores they actually play more nostalgic music while you're shopping, so that you can spend more. Yeah, I think we all just spend more all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but more, I meant um, we choose to be happy, right? You can choose. You can make twenty thousand dollars a year. And be happy. Yeah. You can make two hundred thousand dollars a year and be unhappy, right? So, choose to be happy, and then you know the rest of it is much more likely to fall into place. I love it. All right. Final four question. All right. Let's go. Number one. What does wealth mean to you? Wealth to me means choices that I have the, or a person has the ability to choose, to choose where you live, to choose the work that you do, to choose the lives that you impact and how you impact them. It's a freedom from being chained by somebody else or something else, um, which is why I think wealth can happen at any age or any income level kind of goes with happiness, right? If I, if I make a happy life on $20,000 a year, wealth is going to look one way. Um, if I'm making $200,000 and I have ulcers because I'm worried about things all the time and my health is suffering, then wealth looks very different, right? Because wealth is more than just money. You also, we want to be physically able to do the things that we want to do and, and live the life that we want to live. Um, so it's, it's choices. It's the freedom to choose. All right. Number two, what was your worst money mistake? Ah, oh, that one's easy. A timeshare. They got me way back in the nineties. And, uh, yeah, I, I have a timeshare. So what was it that got you? Back then it seemed like a really, uh, a really good idea. And we didn't, I didn't know I was younger. Um, I didn't know like all the pitfalls of it, um, how the annual fees go up every year, how, you know, now and then there's huge assessments that are made like your own house, you know, like it needs a roof and we didn't save up for the roof. So now everybody has to have, you know, one four hundredth of the roof. Um, yeah. So I, I I either didn't do my homework, and I'm willing to admit that I was smart but ignorant, um, or it just really wasn't much talked about. Um, and at the time, I did use it a lot for traveling because that was the kind of traveling that I did. But now I'm more spontaneous with my traveling, so I don't want to be I want to be tied into one particular way of traveling or one particular place. Um, yeah, so timeshare. Number three. What is your favorite financial or non-financial book? <laughs> I just admitted that I've read an airplane hanger full of books. Um, you know, I've got to throw out the 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 um, big one, the Bible. Uh, my daughter and I are actually reading the Bible this year. We're reading it chronologically. I think we're somewhere in September at the moment, so we're a little behind. But I have hopes that we'll catch up. Um, Love the Total Money Makeover by Dave Ramsey. Uh, was life changing for me at at one point. Uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad, another winner. Um, I love nonfiction. 
of almost any kind. And uh, I like a good, you know, cry at the end fiction novel, you know, <laughs> like messy, like, like messy cry. Yes. But I can only take them so much. Yeah, we might have to uh, do another episode on just books. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice. Uh, number four, what is your favorite dish to make? Ah, I'm Italian. So I like spaghetti and meatballs. We do ziti. We have uh, sausage, peppers, and onions. That's to die for. Um, yeah, I, I cook a lot, actually. I really enjoy it. Nice. Well, I might have to make a trip to the college and be like, hey, I heard you're making a dish. <laughs> yeah, you know, you head up this way. Let me know. I'd be glad to make you uh, Italian food. Awesome. It's hard for me to eat Italian food out. It's not necessarily that my food is the best because I've never had like chefs rate my food. I'm just, I like my food. So if I have something out that I make at home, I'm always disappointed because it doesn't taste like mine. Um, so whenever I eat out in an Italian restaurant, I eat things like chicken parm because I, I love that, but I don't make it very often. Mm. Um, you know, I eat the things that I don't make very often so that I'm not, you know, disappointed. You got to pay a big bill at a restaurant, right? And you're like, I got to make this better at home. Right. <laughs> so I try to avoid that, that feeling. Yeah. I what you, what's your favorite dish to make? My favorite dish? Um, I actually make, um, I, I love desserts. So mine is uh, carrot souffle. I like making carrot souffle. Um, if it was a second dish, I would say it's carrot dogs. So I do enjoy that process. And I like make like home fries and everything like that with it. So it looks like a hot dog on a bun and everything like that. Pretty but cool. it's a carrot. It's a carrot. All right, I'm going to have to Google that. <laughs> I never heard of such a thing. A yeah. Carrot dog. Um, it's really nice. Uh, I try to make it every, like, usually it's a over the summer type deal. I usually make it a lot during the summer. Yeah. Like, good weekend, something to do. Let it marinate in the, the juices or whatever. So. All right, I'm not going to Google it. You send me your recipe. Oh. You have um, it written down? I actually use somebody else's recipe. I just modify it. So I'll take out the things that I don't use. Yeah. Um, because it's mostly, it's, if anything, it's mostly about the marinade than anything else. Because it has to taste, it has to have that like, hot dog smell almost. Mm -hmm. I know it's, it sounds gross, but it works. And, it, and it's uh, really soft and chewable and everything like that. It's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Send me your recipe. That'd be fun. All right. Yeah. I'll send it to you. Cool. Um, the very last question of the show is where could people find out more about you? Well, um, I am on all the social media platforms as Prof. Stacy, the money teacher. I have a website, Prof. Stacy, the money Um, my last name is Mastrolia. So you pretty much could Google Stacy Mastrolia. I don't think there's another one of me. Um, I, I exist in all of the platforms now. Nice. And she's keeping up with all the lingo. So I'm trying. Right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, well, folks, thank you so much for listening. This concludes another insightful episode of the About That Wallet podcast with the brilliant Professor Stacy, uh, the money teacher. We hope you enjoy unraveling the mysteries of the holiday finances and gain valuable insights into navigating the fiscal challenges of the new year. A mass thank you to Stacy for gracing us with her expertise. Reminder, the journey to financial well-being is ongoing and the knowledge, I mean, with the knowledge shared today, you're better equipped to make informed decisions with you know, if you found this episode valuable, uh, don't forget to subscribe, share, and actually leave a review. That actually really does help out the podcast and also so many other people out there. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Y'all be safe. I'm out.